it's an honor for me to be here. And uh, I'll quickly introduce our, uh, our panel uh, to talk to you about the, the role of uh, uh, the private sector in the policy process. Uh, it's hard to do it justice in 50 minutes, so you'll have to sign up for the, uh, the year-long uh, <laughs> workshop on that. Um, to, uh, to my far left is Steve Harper, uh, Global Director of Energy and Environment Policy for Intel Corporation. Uh, in the middle, Lisa Manley, Senior Director of uh, Sustainability, Engagement, and Partnerships for Mars. And uh, to my immediate left, David Brown, Senior Vice President for Federal Government Affairs and Public Policy for Exelon. Um, climate policy has been, uh, we've called it kind of the longest running soap opera um, uh, in Washington and around the globe. It's a, uh, it's a fascinating issue. I've had the privilege of working on it from the beginning. Uh, I covered the uh, congressional hearings in the 80s, and I think I've participated in, in every meeting of the, uh, of the COP negotiating sessions internationally uh, uh, since the early 90s. Um, it is uh, an area of amazing uh, fascination to watch the social change taking place around the globe in terms of the dialogue, but it's also one of uh, amazing frustration. Um, the dialogue policy, when you get right down to it, you've heard a lot of stuff in the last uh, two days about all the great things uh, businesses are doing, industries doing, changes in attitudes and whatnot. And yet the dialogue policy uh, on this issue is still kind of stuck in the old, uh, the old dynamic, uh, the old you emit, therefore we cut mentality. The old, it's, it's industry's fault, so they have to fix it and they have to pay for it. Um, and, and in many respects, I, I think it was Scott Price uh, last night who talked about the three legs of the stool, uh, corporate, uh, individuals, and government, and he commented that government was probably the one most behind the eight ball. Um, the issue really needs to uh, look for a new way to move forward. Um, uh, the reality over the last three decades is that the Industries uh, involved, uh, the private sector involvement um, has been significant, major contributors to the policy dialogue. Uh, I also have to admit, yes, some parts of industry have been major contributors, contributors to the policy deadlock and confusion. But in 1997, the, the policy outline that became the negotiating framework for the Kyoto Protocol, the first mandatory uh, global agreement, uh, came from the business community. Um, in 2010, the major outline of climate legislation that passed in the, in the House of Representatives, the Waxman-Markey bill on the House side, and then there was a Senate companion bill that did not get completed. The major outline of that, again, came from the private sector. Um, the international dialogue that continues to this day and became embodied ultimately in what we now call the Paris Climate Agreement a bottoms-up approach to reducing emissions has included from the beginning the participation of the business industry community, uh, including the longest-running workshop on market mechanisms that you'd ever want to participate in. Uh, and to, to go see this process is amazing. It's frightening. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's 50,000 people at the negotiating meetings now, so it is pretty, pretty much a three-ring circus. But the fact of the matter is the business community is there, it's, it's, it's giving ideas, it's promoting actions, and whatnot. But what does the business community want? They want clarity, they want stability, they want fairness. Now, uh, we define fairness as, you know, they want a level playing field, which means one that's slightly tilted in our favor. Um, but. As you've seen and heard over, over the last several years, hundreds if not thousands of companies have made pledges towards climate action. Just, uh, was just last week, uh, Jeff Bezos pled, made his $10 billion pledge. And so for the most part, the business community is doing things, are doing things, um, and, are, and are involved in that. And uh, the question becomes, in my mind, is, is to what end and to achieve what goal? Um, and how do, you, how do you make that happen in a way that is, that is both cost effective and contributes overall to goals of sustainability? 
Um, these three uh, representatives from the private sector have decades of experience uh, in these issues, both the domestic and uh, global level. Um, and so we've asked them to talk initially about uh, the involvement of, of their companies uh, in the climate policy process and how that's morphed uh, over the years, um, as well as then what's necessary moving forward in, in climate to actually get us to a settled policy uh, that works and provides a path forward. And so uh, what we'd like to do is, is have each of them do quick introductions on, on that subject, and then we'll have a little bit of dialogue, but I'd also like to have the ability to take questions from you in the audience, because I know you're probably uh, just amazed and wondering how this climate policy process finds its way forward. So uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we hope that this is an informative discussion, and uh, we hope that it all helps all of us leaving here knowing that there's, there's hope um, and that you're going to have a role in solutions. Um, but uh, let's chat first and, and get the perspectives from our panelists on the climate policy process and, and uh, how it's been for them and where we should go. Great. David? Thanks, Kevin. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of a background on Exelon because it is fairly unique. Exelon was created in the year 2000 uh, from the merger of two traditional utility companies, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago and what was then Philadelphia Electric Company in Philadelphia. Uh, the predecessor companies had been around for well over 100 years. Uh, we now serve Baltimore, where their utility has been around for over 200 years. Uh, we also serve Washington, D.C., Atlantic City, and Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, that makes us the largest utility in the country with 10 million customers. What's unique is that the formation of Exelon actually came together 20 years ago uh, with the vision of two CEOs who anticipated that climate change would be an issue. And so they brought together two of the cleanest fleets in the country, uh, largely nuclear, but also some hydro, some wind, some solar. And as a result today, uh, not only are we the largest utility in terms of customers served, we're the second largest generator in the country, but we're the largest generator of clean energy in the country, emissions-free generation. And we're the largest by a factor of two. Uh, we're also the cleanest in terms of carbon intensity. When you look at carbon uh, produced per megawatt hour of generation, we are the cleanest utility uh, by a factor of four. Uh, so you hear a lot of pledges from companies who are willing to, to cut their emissions 80% by 2050. Um, we're, we're already there. So we're kind of the skinny kid on the block uh, right now, looking to do even more. As a result, we've been very involved on the policy side since the beginning. Uh, our, our former chairman called for a carbon tax, testified in 1995 uh, in favor of a carbon tax. We were at the table for Waxman-Markey uh, with many of our colleagues in the utility industry. We are currently participating in the uh, Carbon Leadership Council, uh, which has called for a $40 a ton price on carbon with 100% of the proceeds going back to consumers in the form of dividends. Uh, and happy to discuss that at some point. Uh, and we're also members of the CEO Climate Dialogue, which is a group of about 20 companies uh, whose CEOs are personally engaged and involved in uh, efforts in Washington to get policymakers to focus on uh, this important issue. So uh, look forward to the conversation today. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, David. Lisa. Super. Hey, everybody. Um, let me just get a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with Mars Incorporated? <laughs> All right, so my infomercial like will be very short, um, <laughs> but I'll have to give one nonetheless. Um, so you probably know us for chocolates and confections and the chewing gum that we produce. What you may not know is that the majority of our business has transformed away from that and is now focused on pet food and pet care. And then we've got a relatively sizable human food outside of chocolate um, that looks at brands like Uncle Ben's. And I say all of that because as we think about climate change, it's really important to know what a company produces, how it produces, where it produces, because that really has an impact on our climate strategies as well as on our climate advocacy. 
And we've been working on climate action for a good long while. Um, we started, like many companies did, uh, looking at our direct operations. So we were an early um, adopter of sort of a clean energy goal. So we've got a goal to be 100% renew, uh, renewable, uh, powered by renewables. We set that quite a number of years ago. I think we were the first US company to set um, a commitment to 100% renewables. And we're making steady progress. So today, about 53% of the electricity that we use all around the world is coming from renewables. And that's generally through long-term power purchase agreements that we have made in the US and Mexico and Australia um, in the UK and we're just sort of going country by country to try to negotiate those long-term deals. We're also working on renewable thermal which is the other side and the more tricky side I think for us and for everyone else but we're part of a, a, a renewable thermal collaborative that um, we think is is going to be able to find solutions in that space. So when I look ahead on the horizon, I think um, we've got a pretty good sense about where we want to go from our direct operations. But if you look at our broader carbon footprint, direct operations are 5%. Um, so when you look at you know, where we really need to make a difference, it has to be within the agricultural space and it has to be on land use change. So agriculture and land use change, which is essentially deforestation, 80% um, of our carbon footprint. Um, and for us to be able to really make a difference there, we have to have positive policy. So we've set goals. Um, we've got a science-based target that's going throughout our value chain. We want to reduce our emissions by about a third, 27% by 2025 and then by two-thirds by uh, 2050 and to do that we're going to have to really advance a lot smarter agriculture we're going to have to really go after and tackle and halt deforestation in our supply chains so when we're thinking about policy um, there are really three things that um, we're focused on we're trying to get a much swifter adoption of clean energy all around the world. Um, we are also, also fans of carbon pricing, so we think that there has to be a carbon price in order to sort of send the signal to business, all businesses, that we need to do more. And then we have to be thinking about policy as it relates to agriculture. So look forward to the conversation. Excellent. Thank you. Steve. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, um, I did an MBA light, as I call it, an executive MBA many years ago at Chicago, and I wish there had been conferences like this. Um, and maybe there were, and I just wasn't aware of them, but I have found this to be an interesting, great day and a half. Um, so I'm not going to ask you if you know who Intel is. I think pretty much everybody knows who Intel is. Um, five or six years ago, they, some university researcher did a study of the most recognizable sounds uh, in the United States. And our, uh, our little bump, 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 bump came in number two. <laughs> a after the cry of a baby. <laughs> it, it would have been really sad had we come in number one. Um, so, so everybody knows Intel. We're not a consumer facing company. Uh, we don't sell for the most part directly to you unless you're a gamer. Um, we sell to the Dells and HPs and Apples and Googles of the world. Um, but because of that Intel Inside campaign, we are probably the most publicly recognizable non-public uh, brand um, in the world. Uh, but still, a lot of people don't understand the complexity. We actually make stuff. Most high-tech companies design stuff. They turn it over to somebody in Taiwan or China um, to make, and then they market or sell the stuff. We actually make our own stuff. Um, and what that means is we have a footprint. And we're always getting compared to Apple and to Dell and to Facebook and all these other companies. And you know, a lot of people in the environmental community say, you have a much bigger footprint. Yeah, because we make stuff. Um, so, uh, but we also have, so I should just say by way of introduction of my role, I run a team of nine people now around the world who get involved in working with governments on anything governments are interested in relative to our factories 
or to our products um, that are energy, environment, or sustainability related. Our biggest issues are chemicals. We use very small quantities of, and this is true of our industry, not just Intel, very small quantities of fluorinated chemicals, which are global warmers and are not good actors, but you cannot make semiconductors without them. Um, and we also, again, have these large operations which use a lot of water. So water has been a big issue. And on the climate front, um, the chemicals I referred to are both a toxicity Tosca law issue, but also a climate issue. So what have we done? We play defense and we play offense. On the defensive side of things, we have worked for 20 years, 20 plus years, to make sure that governments, if they focus on fluorinated chemicals, focus on reducing emissions, not banning the use. Because if you ban the use, you ban the manufacturing of semiconductors, which are a fundamental building block of modern society. So we have worked very hard and reduced by over 80% our own emissions of fluorinated chemicals, even as we've grown tremendously in the 22 years I've been with the company. But there's a positive side. Um, every industry has a footprint. Uh, that's your direct negative impact. Water, energy, climate, every person has a footprint. Our industry, the IT industry, generally has also a handprint. I think we're the only industry who can say that our technologies, and hopefully they're more efficient over time, those technologies help every other industry reduce their footprint through everything you can think of that's got the word smart in front of them. So increasingly, my job and my team's job and our company's message on climate change, working with our partners like Apple, like Facebook, like Google, like companies like Johnson Controls that use a lot of our products and their solutions, is we pledge to make our footprint as small as we can make it, but we work with governments to get policies in place that encourage investment in our technologies to help other industries and society as a whole reduce its overall footprint. So that's good for me, because it's a lot more fun playing offense than it is playing defense. Good. Thank you for that uh, quick introduction. I guess the first question I'd ask, obviously the policy process has been running now for 30 years. Uh, the uh, the pre-first negotiation that led to the Rio uh, uh, Earth Summit and uh, UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, those meetings started in 1990. Um, has the policy process helped or hindered your own company's uh, actions on climate change, or, did, or did, they, did they enhance it? Did they inhibit it? Uh, did they scare you away? I'll, I'll start. I mean, as a utility, we are among the more highly regulated industries in the country. Uh, I think policy has, has kind of played a role on both sides of the, the coin there. I mean, really, the utility sector has made some remarkable reductions in recent years. Uh, overall, the utility sector emissions are down 27 percent since 2005. On the investor-owned utility side, they're down 37 percent. Uh, we're on a trajectory to cut emissions in half as an industry by 50 percent by 2030 and then 80 percent by 2050. But that's kind of not enough. To date, a lot of that's been driven by customer uh, <coughs> demands, by investor demands, uh, to a lesser extent, state, local, regional uh, government mandates or incentives, uh, some federal tax policy. But uh, really, if we want to deeply decarbonize the utility sector and get to zero by 50, which is what we think we need to do, we need uh, policymakers to step up and put a price on carbon. I think that's the only way they get there. And decarbonizing the utility sector is kind of the low-hanging fruit uh, as well. We've made tremendous progress as a, largely as a result of gas to, uh, or coal to gas switching um, and also renewables and then the nuclear uh, plants. Nuclear accounts for about 10 percent of the installed capacity in the U.S., but 20 percent of the generation because it runs all the time. And as a result of that, it's actually 55 percent of all the clean energy uh, in the country. So we're, we're punching above our weight there. But we really need uh, policymakers to step up and, and give us that price on carbon if we're going to get all the way there and then subsequently be able to start electrifying other sectors like transportation and, and industry. Lisa? 
So it's late in the day and we are among friends, so I think we should be really candid and say that the policy scenario today is a hot mess. Um, <laughs> I think it's a hot mess um, on this particular issue. Um, there's very little, almost no, harmony in terms of sort of how governments are thinking about and acting upon climate change. Um, there's still too much dismissal of the issue. And then the things that have been incentivized through policies in many cases are not the things that should be incentivized through policy. And then the things that ought to be incentivized, like innovation, smart agriculture, and much more, better transportation, those things aren't being considered in a thoughtful way. And there is, I think, woefully um, slow movement on the topic of a global price on carbon. Um, I mean, I've studied that a bunch recently, and I mean, it's just remarkable. Huh? Um, you know, what is it? The average price is under $10 per ton. Um, you know, research shows that it needs to be $75 per ton. We've got a bill here in the U.S. at 40, which is a movement in the right direction. And then we've got one country, I think it's in, might be Finland, um, that's pricing it at 175 and has found that that has been actually good for their economy. Um, so there's, it's the wild, wild west. And I think what we need, and why I'm super excited that we're having this conversation, is we need to have a lot more business voice and a lot more business advocacy for climate action. And I've been super happy to hear this topic be you know, brought up in oh so many of the conversations throughout the past two days, because until policymakers hear from business after business after business and industry after industry after industry, we're going to continue to be at this place of woefully inadequate movement. Thank you. Steve. I would say from our perspective, the answer is it's a little bit like a sine wave. Um, in the beginning, um, we first took significant action to reduce our emissions of fluorinated gases, which were 90% roughly of our total emissions at that point, because we were afraid Europe was going to ban the use of those gases. And so we, we ran and, and developed a global semiconductor industry voluntary commitment to reduce emissions by more than the Kyoto target, sooner than the Kyoto timetable. And we ended up, I think as an industry, meeting 56% reductions in that period of time. And we avoided, in fact, in Europe where they don't like voluntary commitments, Europe for four straight generations of their relevant regulations have exempted our industry because we've taken more action, I think, on a voluntary basis than any other industry, um, at least in the Europe, European perspective. So that drove, that policy fear drove aggressive action initially. Of late, there's been very little action, at least at the federal level. I think Paris is a great shibboleth, but I'm not sure it's much more than that. Uh, Kigali is much more important uh, from an emissions reduction standpoint. Uh, so at the international level, things are, you know, in better shape than they were. But for the longest time, I would say for most of the last 10 years, we didn't take action as a company because of government policy. We took action because of shareholder interest, stakeholder interest, and most importantly, employee interest. You know, we went from... I used to write articles on our internal website on climate change policy, particularly in the days when cap and trade was going to pass. And our two big manufacturing sites in the U.S. are Portland, Oregon, and Phoenix, Arizona. And I used to get these letters back from everybody in Arizona would say, God damn it, I'm a shareholder. Why are we wasting our money on this foolish stuff, you know, called climate change? And the people in Oregon would say, this is the most important issue in the history of the world. Why are, you know, why are you kibitzing about the details? Just do what they tell you to do. Now when I do an article every year or so, um, I get uniformly, uniformly, strongly positive messages about this is what we should do. And so that's, that's critical. Looking forward, you know, it's, it's a little unclear. I, I will finish by just kibitz, uh, kibbling, quibbling, kibbling, quibbling. <laughs> kibble, kibble. Is, Move on. Kibble is, what, <laughs> kibble is what I had for breakfast. Um, you feed it to cats. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think 
people talk about there needs to be a price for, for carbon or a price on carbon. From my perspective as a half-assed economist, there need to be prices on carbon. Uh, there are sectors of the economy for which a simple carbon tax does not make it through to the consumer for a variety of reasons. And there are markets which are very price insensitive. And unless you had a, a tremendously high tax, you're not going to have a big impact. But every time you regulate carbon, a direct federal command and control regulation, that increases the cost of, of, of emitting carbon. That in itself, from an economic standpoint, is a price on carbon. So I think we need a mix of different kinds of prices on carbon that are tailored to the economic circumstances of different se emitting sectors in the economy. It sounds like almost so uniformly you all think there needs to be some kind of price on carbon, some kind of price mechanism. And that actually, David, as you and I talked, uh, I, I organized a coalition called the International Climate Change Partnership in 1991. It was the first progressive industry coalition on the climate issue. Uh, Intel Corporation has been our chair for a long time. Uh, Exelon's John Rowe was a chair for Exelon and, and was uh, one of our founding, uh, founding company uh, members at the time. And we felt then that a, a carbon tax was the simplest way to go to get things moving. We were afraid to say that publicly, though. And, and so it was, uh, that dynamic has now changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but is, is a pricing mechanism enough? No, I mean, it's one means of, of thriving, trying to sort of change behavior, but there are lots of other things that I think have to go hand in hand with um, a price. I mean, we need much more investment in resilient infrastructure. Um, I mean, the list could go on and on, but I think a price is a critical element of, within sort of a suite of policy actions that we need around the world. Well, and as Steve noted, it, it's going to vary, the impact's going to vary by industry. I mean, uh, as part of the CLC proposal, you would roll back the regulations on stationary source utility power plants because $40 a ton gets you a lot of emissions reduction. It would not take out the cafe standards in the transportation sector because to really move the needle uh, on gasoline, you've got to get close to $200 a ton right. probably. Right. So um, complementary pro uh, regulatory processes are probably well. In, in, well. In, in, I'm sorry, David. Uh, in, in addition, um, we're all talking mitigation here. Let's talk adaptation and resilience. You can put any price on future carbon emissions and that may help slow or stop or reverse long term the you know the atmospheric chemistry changes that we have seen but there are already changes baked into the system that as we're seeing through funky weather and through sea level rise um, you know are the price we're paying for not having a price of carbon in the past and so people talk infrastructure bills and yeah, we really need to take seriously um, the notion that five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, major parts of this country, and even more seriously in low-lying places like Bangladesh, are gonna be underwater. And um, the infrastructure and human costs associated with that, but by the same token, the ability to turn that into an argument, for example, for green infrastructure, right? in cities to try and use nature as a protective mechanism, uh, that's a lost opportunity from a city and regional planning standpoint. So those are things we, we can't just focus on the future and future effects in a price. We need to think about repairing or minimizing the negative impacts of what's already baked in. Sidebar note on the adaptation costs. Uh, uh, you all are going to start seeing the literature on this. More and more material is now starting to appear on adaptation costs. And those numbers all start with a T in the trillions. And so that will become a driving force. One of the fears those of us in the policy process have had is, does that become so large that it freezes everybody and everybody's afraid and they don't know what to do? Um, so watch that space. But I'm curious, one of the things that we've talked about in climate policy, 
was the need for some kind of a long-term objective. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to reach a goal if you don't have one. Um, and that was a big part of the early negotiations in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, it was part of the Paris Agreement where they did come up with a, with a um, uh, I'll call it a target, uh, still mostly a, a more a voluntary target. But in terms of an objective, what is the, uh, is there a difference in terms of what does long term mean to different, your industry compared to your industry, your, your, your product line is eight months, um, life, yours is longer than that, uh, and yours is, 40, 60, yeah, it's forever. Years, right, yeah. <laughs> so what, is the, is the timing of a policy process critical to you. The biggest fear I found in talking to companies was their fear of immediate short-term impacts that all of a sudden were going to damage the, the business outlook. Kevin, for us, you're right. Our product shelf lives are fairly short. It depends on the nature of the product. But the reality is it takes 10, 15, 20 years to do the planning and the technology development you know, we're putting seven, eight, nine billion transistors on a piece of silicon, half the size of your fingernail, your thumbnail. And in order to get to that level of precision, there's 10 or 15 years of technology development that go into the design of the tools. These are $100 million hermetically sealed machines where the, the magic gets done, and the selection of the chemicals that have to work with the tools. And so for us, long-term, stability and a long-term target driving or supported by stable policy is really critical because the worst thing in the world for us, and we've seen it occasionally on, not, not because of climate, but because of Tosca reasons, is we get six months out from the ramp of a $5 billion factory with a new process and a new chemi chemical set, and somebody raises their hand, whether it's Europe or the United States, or California and says, you can't use that chemical because of climate or because of toxicity reasons or whatever. And that's an intolerable situation for us. So even though the individual product life cycles are short, the process life cycles long. are longer and stability towards a known objective is important for us as well. Lisa? Yeah, so I mean, I think in one, way or the, in one way or another, the timing is never going to be right. Um, and I think the fact that the timing is not going to be convenient for any of our businesses is why we continue to sort of delay and delay and delay. I think, you know, the, the reality is that um, the science is pointing us in the right pathway. So we know what science is telling us about climate change. We know what it's telling us about the time that we have to act. The clock is ticking. It's ticking really fast, and we are way behind. So it's not necessarily going to be good for every industry. It ought not to be good for every industry. But we all need to embrace the science and put forward, sort of step forward on paths that are going to be aligned with the science, and we need policy to also be science-based. And you know, until we get there, um, you know, we can quibble on, on you know, what's the right timing and you know, what's the relevance of an incremental target. Um, but we've, I think, moved beyond, the world has moved beyond uh, sort of a, a place where we should be tolerating uh, incremental change. David? Yeah, in the utility sector, I mean, we're, we're not waiting. We can't afford to. Uh, you know, once you get a power plant or a transmission or distribution facility in place, it's going to last anywhere from 40 to 80 years. So, you know, Superstorm Sandy obviously wiped out a lot of the system in, in southern New Jersey. We didn't rebuild it like it was before, right? We moved it mm -hmm. to higher elevations and stronger, more <coughs> resilient, uh, you know, uh, hardware and systems and equipment. Um, and we're doing that throughout our system. And it's not only in the coastal states like Maryland and New Jersey and Delaware, it's, uh, it's in the Midwest in Chicago. You know, when we do an assessment of what does a, a 1.5 degree C or a 2 degree C world look like for our system, uh, our initial thought out of the box was, well, obviously the coastal areas will be the most impacted. Ironically, uh, the most investment is gonna be needed in Chicago because the increase in sustained 90 degree days 
is going to put such a strain on the system that it's got to be significantly uh, rebuilt and, and uh, made much more robust. So shift from long-term objectives to short-term quarterly financial reports. What is the biggest challenge you have? Uh, th these uh, students will be advising CEOs, will become CEOs. What is the biggest challenge you have in advising your CEO uh, on a process, on a policy process like climate? And, and in, in your view, does, does engagement from the corporate sector happen in a company if the CEO is not invested in the issue? The answer is no. Uh, for the most part, but I think CEOs who aren't aware of and to at least internally to a large degree invested in the issue are probably not long for um, their career. Um, and um, I, I just think, you know, our, we have a, our current CEO, our previous CEO was very green. Our current CEO is, is a former CFO. And, um, you know, he's a numbers guy, but he understands because he's smart and he reads the paper um, and he listens to staff that this is an issue that he has to pay attention to. And he hears about it from employees. Um, so, but I, I do think it makes a difference. Uh, we're not part of the, the leadership group because it's, uh, it's not an issue that would drive our CEO to spend time every day on as opposed to time every week on. Um, and it's, it's not as central to our business as it would be to a utility. Um, but it's still an important issue that we don't have to fight to get mind share on uh, or time in front of him. Lisa? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, CEO uh, action is super important, but perhaps more important, um, Mars, is, Mars continues to be a family-owned business. So what the family is focused on is just as important as what our CEO is focused on. And within the Mars family, there is a tremendous emphasis on sustainability and on climate action. And so much so that um, you mentioned sort of quarterly reporting. We're not beholden to do sort of any sort no. of reporting to the outside world. But um, we are rethinking the way that we measure business performance. So traditionally, as you all know, we've been measuring business performance based on finances. Today, we've got what we call a compass that looks at financial performance, quality growth, positive societal impact, and trust in society. Those are the four things that Mars is measuring its business success around. And so when you think about things like quality growth, that's the reason that we're moving from a predominantly chocolate-oriented business to a predominantly pet-oriented business. Chocolate has a heck of a lot of headwinds coming at it. Pet has a bunch of tailwinds. So the business is really sort of thinking about, um, <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm, is, that, is that the yeah. corporate slogan coming out now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's interesting to sort of see businesses begin to just sort of rethink what success is um, and, and look at measures that go well beyond um, financial success. Yeah, so our world has been turned totally upside down in the last 10 years. Uh, Exelon's fleet, we've got 22 nuclear plants across the country. Um, a decade ago when natural gas was in the $10 to $12 range, uh, we were printing money. Um, and, and it was, it was uh, the high point of the, the company and power markets. We operate in, in exclusively in competitive power markets, so we're subject to the price of, of fuels. Um, since then, natural gas has fallen to $2. Everybody thought that it would get back up to, to 4 probably. Uh, yesterday, I think it was sitting at 186 uh, And traditionally, the heart of the winter is when you see gas prices spike. So it has been a gargantuan change in wholesale power markets and the ability of nuclear plants to continue to operate economically. About half the plants in the country are really under economic threat right now. And as I said, those plants produce 55% of our emissions-free generation right now. So the quarterly calculus is, okay, how do we balance the hope for a near-term or fairly near-term price on carbon 
whether that's at the federal level or the state level or the regional level, with the fact that some of these units are hemorrhaging cash. Um, and uh, how long do you wait uh, before you just pull the plug and, and retire them early? And we've had to retire two plants uh, prematurely. Uh, one was more of a political issue, um, and then one last September was, was more just straight economics. It was in Pennsylvania, in the middle of Pennsylvania, surrounded by a bunch of shale gas. Just couldn't make it uh, uh, competitive economically. It's one of the best running power plants in the world. Um, and the emissions uh, associated with that uh, was equivalent uh, to, to all the renewables built in about a four state region over the last 25 years. So uh, we are going backwards. Every time you retire a nuclear plant, you're just going backwards. You're, you're the hamster on the wheel. You're, you're running as fast as you can. You're not making any progress. So an example of where a policy might help clarify the future better for you in terms of path forward. Yeah, well, so there are a few. Um, you know, there, there's some discussion in Washington about a clean energy standard right. uh, where you'd get an increasingly uh, high percentage of your generation uh, from clean, non-emitting resources. Uh, there's a cap and trade program, obviously a, a price on carbon. We've seen uh, certain states like Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut enact state programs uh, to recognize the emissions-free value of nuclear. Uh, and those were, were rolling along nicely. They'd been challenged in court. The courts had upheld them. And then, lo and behold, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, sloop, swooped in in the end of December and said, oh, you're in competitive markets. You can't pay them these subsidies. Uh, you've got to back those out of the, the market uh, process. Mm -hmm. So um, those states are currently kind of revamping and taking a look at what the new FERC rules are and trying to figure out how to put a program into place that, that passes muster there. Okay. Questions from the audience. If you have a question, uh, can you come up to the microphone? Uh, in the meantime, let me ask you, domestic dialogue versus international dialogue, is it different here it than is. elsewhere? It, it, it's very different. Um, we have, I think any global company, and we clearly are a global company, has to um, take this on from a global perspective. Half of our employees are in the United States only 20% of our market is here, okay? And so we have to pay attention to rules and regulations in China. And oh, by the way, China is now regulating and China is now enforcing their regulations. Europe is all over this with their new, uh, not the new Green Deal, but their Green Deal. So in our competitors internationally, the first question our CEO asks when he finds out that we're spending three or $400 million a year on greenhouse gas, abatement that we're not required to by law is what are our competitors doing? And luckily we can go to Taiwan and TSMC, which is our major competitor, and it turns out they do more than we do. So, you know, my client, the head of manufacturing in the company, has a very strong suit to play because she couldn't play the international off against the domestic. Lisa, what about you? Both absolutely critical. Um, I mean, clearly we've taken some steps back, I think, um, here in the United States in the past few years, um, and we need to get back um, on the right pattern for, for, for policy action that supports the environment. Um, but, uh, you know, we are just as active in the U.S. as we are in, you know, each of the countries where we operate around the world. And also on the global stage, I mean, you know, you'll find us at cops and, you know, elsewhere, um, you know, talking wherever we can about um, the business risk and the business case for climate action. Okay. Question. Hi. Uh, David from Darden. Uh, question is for you, David, uh, regarding nuclear. Uh, it sounds like the nuclear energy industry in the U.S. is obviously struggling due to high regulation environment. Uh, internationally, we're seeing the closure of nuclear plants in predominantly nuclear-powered countries such as France and Japan. Now, I was curious, as new nuclear technologies are being tested and funded, where are there international opportunities for U.S. companies to help sort of sponsor a resurgence or a proof of principle of these new nuclear technologies? Sure. Uh, great question. And uh, we've got a really good operating track record. So often as nuclear vendors look to land overseas contracts, they'll draft us to come as a partner to be the operator uh, of some of these uh, projects. 
Um, the U.S. Uh, has not been real successful overseas at this point, simply because we haven't built in the U.S. in quite a while. Uh, there are a couple of units under construction right now in Georgia uh, that are nearing the finish line, but they're later than expected and more expensive than expected. Uh, so we need to kind of improve our track record there. But uh, interestingly, the Middle East is an enormous market right now uh, where they're building uh, four Korean reactors in the UAE uh, and uh, the Saudis are actually interested in nuclear. Uh, the U.S. Is, is not really in that mix yet because uh, of certain restrictions uh, that the U.S. government has uh, and the need to enter into some agreements on, uh, on non-proliferation. Um, and there are uh, some, some, there is some interest in, in uh, Southeast Asia as well uh, to get going on nuclear. And the, the Brits keep going back as a carbon abatement uh, mechanism to, to looking at nuclear. So uh, there are plenty of places in play, uh, and I think you'll see um, more countries get engaged there. Interestingly, the French had a, uh, a policy to kind of accelerate renewable development and scale back the nuclear. Um, I think that they're drifting towards a policy where they're only going to take the nuclear offline to the extent that the renewables are there to replace them. And that's not what we're seeing here. Uh, there was such an incentive to build uh, renewables that in some cases it jeopardized uh, nuclear <coughs> units in certain regions of the country. So it'd be great if we had a policy that said, let's build more renewables, let's build them as fast as we can, but let's take the emitting stuff off first and then get to the, the other non-emitting. Thank you. Question. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm, Mary, I'm Lindsay Walsh from Mary Baldwin. And you've all agreed that we need to price carbon in a way that's going to make it um, incentivized for companies to, of course, respond to that. But in your professional experience, have you found that policy um, that's proactive and gives tax deductions is more effective? Or do you find that tax policy that penalizes those not abiding has been more effective in enacting change? Who wants that? So I'll go to the utility sector because that's where most of this has been. Um, you know, so far we've been rewarding renewables and non emitting technologies, and that's certainly getting stuff built, um, but at a tremendous cost. Uh, the last time the wind PTC got extended, it was about a $16 billion uh, package, uh, and it's effective. It, it obviously works. Um, there was some discussion earlier about energy storage. Uh, you know, energy storage has been, been uh, really ignored in terms of federal funding and research and development in recent years, certainly compared to, um, to uh, renewables. Uh, if we solve the storage problem, we solve a lot of problems. I mean, then all of a sudden wind and solar are not intermittent anymore. They're reliable because they can store it when it's not needed and then deploy it when it is. Um, I think that, that you could argue both sides. Uh, you, could, you could just give tax incentives to all non-emitting, uh, or you could tax the emitting. Um, politically, uh, as hard as this is to believe, spending money these days is easier than uh, raising money as a tax, uh, which given our current fiscal situation just seems uh, very difficult to believe. But politically, uh, the, the politicians like handing out the candy a lot more than they like taking it away. Well, you know, and I, I would add to that, it, it used to be, you know, Lord Keynes was taken seriously, and when the economy was slow, you, you deficit spend, and when the economy's going great booms like it is for most people, not all, uh, today you then tax and you replenish the kitty. And, you know, we're spending like drunken sailors, just at the same time we should be uh, putting money away for the inevitable crash. What I think is going to happen as part of why I'm skeptical about tax policy writ large and climate is there, there's too many temptations to try and use the tax system to affect too many different social objectives, political objectives, including buying votes by giving money out uh, through tax cuts, that we act as if tax policy was done in a laboratory somewhere, you know, or was a result of an algorithm that everybody agreed upon. And that's just not the way it works. And, um, you know, the last time I lived through the cap and trade wars along with Kevin, that wasn't, that wasn't a tax per se, 
but it would have raised a ton of money. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why cap and trade collapsed as a viable concept 10 years ago was because everybody wanted to get their share of you know the billions of dollars that were going to be raised by the um, by the auction of allowances. So I don't know the answer to your question. I'm just suspicious of going in that realm because of how messy tax policy politics are. There's a strong lack of confidence in the in the reliability of the tax politics yeah. involved in this, and that's a big that's a big fear. We're technically out of time. I'm going to take one more question. Thank you. Um, I'm Sid. I'm a second year uh, MBA at Wharton. Um, I had a question on the Green New Deal, so I'll make this last one count. Um, so um, I really appreciate the ambition um, of, of the, the Green New Deal, but I worry about the pragmatism of implementing something like this. Um, so I wonder, um, I want to hear, as you guys think about advocating for the, the corporate voice and corporate interests, like how to um, shape policy that is both ambitious and aggressive and can meet the science-based uh, targets, but is also uh, achieving the stability and the fairness that you uh, started out talking about. So I'm, I'm going to come at this perhaps in a, a, a circular, circuitous way, um, you know, not necessarily with a reaction to the Green New Deal, but um, you know, whatever deal we have um, needs to put us on the path to what the science says is necessary. It needs to be transparent in um, the way that it is applied and, you know, where it has to do with taxes and revenue. Um, you know, we need to be quite transparent about what's coming from where and where it's going. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this already, but, you know, whether it's a tax or, you know, some other sort of, um, you know, pricing mechanism, that has to be just one piece in a much more comprehensive series of, of, of regulations. Um, so I, I realize that's not going straight at the Green New Deal. Um, you know, I personally think that, you know, it is time for a new deal. Um, you know, I don't know that we would agree with everything that's you know currently in the Green New Deal, but um, it is time for a new deal. Steve? Yeah, this is a personal uh, perspective, not a company perspective. Um, I've spent much of my career focused on climate change as one of the top two or three big issues, uh, and it's sort of become personal. Climate politics are hard enough without ladling on top of it Medicare for all and restructuring the economy um, to make it more just, all of which might be good ideas. The, the latter I certainly agree with. Medicaid for all, I'll leave to the healthcare economists. Um, I, just, I just don't think, my own personal view is we're a centrist country, country historically, and when we veer too far to the left or to the right, there's always a swing back of the pendulum. And um, I, I just fear taking on too much um, at any one time. Now, there's the other, you know, never waste a good crisis <clears throat> perspective. And if we ended up in a, in a severe downturn economically, you know, maybe that argues for all of the above. But I, I'm just worried we're never gonna get to climate change which is existential. And the final thing I'll say is one of the problems politically I think we have with climate change and with fixing Medicare and with health care and with fixing the economy is we live in a time when the problems out there probably require government intervention more than ever. But we also live at a time where government has less credibility with the populace that they can do anything competently. You know, look at this, you know, infrastructure issues. So you've got that clash of need and doubt um, that I think are going to make the politics of the Green New Deal very difficult. David? Yeah, I, I, and I do think you need to look at the Green New Deal as two separate and distinct packages. There's the New Deal component and then there's the Green Deal component. And I'll talk about the Green Deal component. I mean, I, I think, uh, again, the ambition is certainly great. Uh, the thing that I worry about is that it's a very amorphous 
objective right now. And if you talk to 15 members of Congress who are sponsors of the New Green Deal, you'll get 15 different interpretations of what that means. Some will say, oh, it's all renewables by date X. Some will say, well, it's anything clean. Some will say, no, it's, it's some sort of mix. Um, you know, for us, if we are looking at this as an existential threat, we can't afford to unnecessarily n narrow our focus on certain technologies. Anything that meets the threshold of being clean and non-emitting needs to be included in that process. We don't have time, we don't have the money to get there by relying on just a very narrow set of technologies. So, um, you know, the, the newest thing, a lot of companies are, are out there doing 100% renewables or looking at 100% renewables. That's great. I think that's a, a fantastic target to have. Um, but as they wait to get to 100% renewable, they could be 100% clean today if they uh, entered into agreements on the nuclear side. You know, the District of Columbia was looking to set a very aggressive 100% uh, target, and they came to us and they said, you know, we want to be 100% renewables. And we said, okay, well, let's take a look at what that means, how long it would take, and what the cost was. And we said, by the way, you know, you could, you could be 100% clean tomorrow. Tomorrow, very cost effectively, uh, if you include nuclear as a non-emitting technology. And politically, they couldn't bring themselves to do it. Um, but, you know, I just would encourage you to, to take the blinders off uh, and not be, be so narrowly focused on one technology when the problem is really uh, so big that we need every, every clean technology that we can get out there. Yes or no answer. Does the Paris Climate Agreement survive and lead us to solution? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Skeptical. <laughs> I, I, look, I think, I think even those countries that are all in aren't getting there yet. Um, it's a process. Uh, last question. Uh, does uh, the U.S. have a federal climate policy? Yes. They have one today. Absence of a policy is a policy. Absence of a policy, that's true. Okay, okay. Thank you. And, and when do you think there is a U.S. federal climate policy? Five years, 10 years, 15 years? F uh, five years. Uh, let's hope when the current president is um, moved yeah. out, um, and then we will move in with a new and a real climate policy. Okay. Okay. Which is why I'm going to guess January 20th of 2025. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> you've been you've been a very attentive audience, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I've taught a class here on climate at Darden for 27 years, and uh, I remind all the students that we've sort of fumbled with the issue for the last three decades. It's going to be yours to solve, and uh, good, it's, a, good luck. It's, an incredibly, it's an incredibly important responsibility, but one that we know that you're capable of. Uh, I run three different industry coalitions. One's, one is responsible for the Montreal Protocol. And we recently succeeded in getting the Kigali Amendment adopted, which is worth saving a half a degree warming. Uh, we just started a new coalition called the Global Food Cold Chain Council. And uh, food loss and waste is the third largest emitter, China, U.S., and food loss and waste. And uh, the goal of the Cold Chain Council is to sustainably expand the cold chain to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In our coalition activities that these companies have been involved in, uh, you know, it says, well, how do you get this done? How do you get the companies to work together? Well, we ask the companies to come to the dialogue with their own parochial interests in mind, but we're willing to take one step back and say, okay, well, what's the right thing to do? And that's what you have to do. You've got to be able to advise your CEOs, to advise your companies, to build your businesses, be able to look at, you know, what's the right idea, what's the, what's the way to go, and how do I participate in this process? And yes, you're out there to build shareholder value. You're out there to, to find ways to, to improve sustainability. Uh, but it, it all comes back to you need to be willing to step back, 
say, what's the right thing to do? And then go back and figure out that long-term objective of how you get there. Um, it's been a great conference. I'd like to thank the organizers, and uh, uh, good luck to all of you. And uh, we hope you have a lot of success at solving the problems we're handing off. So. Yeah.